Okay. All right. Well, thank the uh, you know few of you that are here for being here. Appreciate it. Um, I just told uh, everyone the answers to the midterm before we started recording, so that's really good. But you know, I'm sure you'll be fine even if you didn't do that. Um, let's see. The assignment's going well. Uh, you know. Uh, let's see. I, I think you're all learning a lot about um, how difficult it is to establish trust, especially on an environment like an online forum or a messaging service where you have no way of verifying people's identities or who they are and those kinds of things and people can easily create new things and um, so yeah, you know, be vigilant, be nice, uh, use physical reality is also a good, you know, thing like actually seeing someone and it uh, can be a good thing. So anyways, you'll figure it out. It's and uh, it'll all be over at the end of spring break. So that should be good. Cool. All right. So now we're going to jump back into networking. So we have been talking about the address resolution protocol and the address resolution protocol. Let's go back to our nice kind of split diagram here. So ARP kind of technically sits at the link layer. Um, technically sits at the link layer, but it actually has to deal with the IP layer and the link layer. So remember, so in the situation that we're talking about here, we want to send some IP packet from one machine, the machine we're on, to another machine. What do we need to know about that machine? Louder? It's address. What address? Yeah. IP address. Yeah, we need to be very specific, right? Because there's many types of addresses, as we'll see. So we need to know its uh, IP address. And uh, for those on the chat, the midterm thing was a joke. I'm sorry for doing that to you. But it was a joke. I had, didn't mention anything. Um, the yeah. So we need. So we have our IP address. We want to send a message to another IP address, and that's all we have. So we talked about we can use uh, CIDR and we saw that notation for determining what's part of the network, what's part of the host of an IP address, and that's used to determine whether a, a host is on your local network or remote network. And where this comes into play and is important is when we want to do direct delivery. So this is when we get a packet or when we want to send a packet and we have the target IP address and we say, is it in our local network? Now, to answer that question, do we just need to know their IP address and our IP address? What else do we need? Butter? We need, no, not quite, not yet. We're get, we'll get there. We do need the MAC address to send it over the link layer, but how do we determine whether something is in our local network and we can use direct delivery versus remote network? Yes, so the subnet mask, the CIDR, the net host split, all those are same ways of determining. We need a way of determining, is this IP address on our local network? And we went through some examples uh, on Tuesday. So once we've determined that and we've said, yes, it is on the local network, we now want to send some IP, uh, some uh, Ethernet frames. So we want to use the link layer to send that packet on our local network. The problem is we don't know the MAC address. So MAC addresses are six bytes which are different than how big how many bytes are ip addresses four 32 bits four bytes that was like was a trick question i phrased it slightly differently but you know so it's helpful to think about these things in different ways and how they're represented so uh okay cool so we got that and then so now that's where ARP comes in. So ARP comes in when, huh, I want to make, I want to send an IP packet to somebody on my local network. I need to know their MAC address in order to send a ethernet packet, but I don't know their MAC address. Do we know our MAC address? Yeah, we should, we're that system. If we don't have a MAC address, it's like not having an, an IP address. We can't talk to anybody. So we need to know our MAC address. We know our IP address, we know our, uh, net mask, and then we also know the targets, the, the destinations IP address. Cool. So this is a protocol that we'll see allows you to ask basically all hosts on your local network, hey, 
who has this IP address? And then they'll respond back with, oh, this IP address is at this MAC address, as we'll see, so that we can then use it in direct delivery. So it's actually kind of crazy to even send out a packet before we need to do that, we have to figure out that MAC address. So we need to send other data at the link layer in order to figure that out. So our request is fairly simple. We'll look at it um, here and then I'll show some examples. So essentially, so we can use on the, so we have two hosts here, like in our example, we have uh, host A, 192.168.1.100, host B, 192.168.1.10, and they have two different MAC addresses. I'm not gonna read them uh, out loud. Now, a good check, what would be uh, like a CIDR notation, like a slash something that would say that host A and host B are on the same local network? Slash 24, what else? Is that the only one? What was that? Yeah. Slash 16 in the chat, right? Anything from 24 to 16, all the way up to, I think, the most you can do is slash seven, I think, or slash, I don't know if you can do a slash eight or slash seven, but yeah, all of those, right? And, and probably down even further than 24. I don't know exactly 100 in hex and binary. I'm sorry for that, but um, if you did that, then you could figure out exactly how far you could go. This is another way to check, oh, if I have these two IP addresses, how do I make sure they're in the same local network? So you can think about net maps in that, in that way. Um, I guess another check, do they have to have the same net maps? I'm seeing some nodding on in person, and then I'm seeing a blank stairs, and I'm getting crickets in the chat. So why yes? Somebody argue to me why it's yes, they should have the same net mask. Because if they don't have the same subnet mask, when we compare them to each other, we're comparing apples to oranges. So we're saying this one has this many bits have its network address, and this one has X number more or less bits. Yeah, I think um, that's very good. I'd say you're comparing apples to oranges is good. What I'd say is if you flip around the situation, right? Because we want, to know if we send a packet from A to B and then B responds back, it's gonna do the same calculation and say, is 192.168.1.100 within my net mask? So if it says no, it's gonna send the packet somewhere else and chaos will ensue. So this is why you need all hosts on your local network to have the same uh, net mask. So it's about the, the having to communicate back and forth, right? That's kind of the, the key principle here. And if they're not set up the same, you could have some IP addresses on your local network that you can't actually talk to because they don't know how to respond back to you. Although it may actually work, it just kind of all depends, but it would be bad and not fun. Um, okay, so with an ARP request, so what we're gonna do is we can use, uh, if you're on Linux, you can use the ARP-A command to show you um, the operating system's cache of what IP addresses map to what MAC addresses. Why does your operating system want to cache that? So you don't have to ask every time, right? It would be insane if every packet you wanted to send, especially if you're starting a long communication between A and B, right? You're sending packets back and forth. We know what was the minimum size of an Ethernet frame? Is it big or small? Smallish, right? It was uh, 1500 bytes. How does that compare to the size of like an IP packet? IP packet had two bytes, so 16 bits for the size. How many bytes is that in an IP packet? Sixteen bit size. What's the maximum value you can have in sixteen bits? We 
You have to calculate it out. Yeah, 65,000, whatever, whatever, whatever. Three, five, fives. There's threes and fives in the rest. I don't really remember. Two to the 16th, right? Or two to the 15 minus one. Um, yeah, so that's kind of helps you kind of conceptualize. So if there's a huge file being sent back and forth between host A and host B, let's say, I don't know, a gigabyte file. If I'm using Ethernet, I have to split up that data into chunks of size 1500 and to send those across. And if I had to do this ARP request to say, hey, who has this MAC address every single time, that would greatly reduce performance. So this is why your operating system will say, hey, oh, it'll check its cache and say, oh, I don't know who has what MAC address maps to that IP address. Let me ask the network, which we'll see in a second. It asks everyone, and then once it gets a response, it updates its cache, and it uses that for a fixed amount of time. I think it varies depending on the operating system of how long it keeps it around. I think it's something on the order of a day. Um, so cool. Okay, so we're gonna we're on host A. We're looking at the ARP cache. We get nothing out. That command shows us nothing. It means that there's a fresh ARP cache. You can actually use this command. Also, you read the man page. You can clear your ARP cache. Um, and then we can ping 192.168.1.10. So this is, we're going to try to send an IP packet to 192.168.1.10. Uh, we saw IP is a special case of an ICMP packet, but that detail doesn't matter. But before we can actually do that, so what this output is, uh, this is something you're going to get more familiar with, is uh, this is just the uh, TCP dump. So TCP dump is an application that looks at a uh, at the network and you can configure it to show you what's going on. So what's going on here is we are so the way ARP works, we first have to ask because we don't know. It's kind of an interesting conceptual problem. You're at the link layer, right? You're trying to ask who has this IP address at the link layer. But you need that message to go to everyone, because if you knew where that message was supposed to go, you wouldn't have to ask. So that's the special address. So on the far left is our host A's MAC address, 8046748A3. The next is all one. So FFFFFFFF, this is a special notation in, um, in at the link layer. Sorry, I'm actually going to type. The special situation at the link layer, which is the broadcast address. So no physical MAC address can have all ones as its MAC address. And what this means is it tells the, the network or the switch, hey, this message is meant for everyone on the network. So when you send this message out, it gets blasted to every machine on your local network because they're gonna be listening for it. So it's an ARP request. And then the middle part is basically um, uh, TCP dump parsing the ARP request, which you can look at the docs if you're really interested about exactly how that happens. And that it, it uh, corresponds to ARP, who has 192.168.1.10, tell 192.168.1.100. So when you send this out, it goes every single machine on this network, including host C, gets that message. So what does host C do when it gets that message? Throws it away. Why? Yeah. They look at the packet. They say, oh, this is for 192.168.1.10. That's not me. I drop it. Boom. I'm not going to reply. Right? Every machine gets that, and every machine has to decide what to do. Host B gets it, and what does host B do? Yeah. It looks. It says, oh, that is my IP address. Great. Somebody wants to talk to me. I'm so happy. Do they send a broadcast message back? Why? Say it again. Yes, so this is one of the key things when you're thinking through these communication protocols. What information does what side have during the process? Right, so host A at the start of this process does not only knows the IP address, doesn't know the MAC address of host B. And so it broadcasts out widely to everyone on the network. Hey, who has this? I, what MAC address corresponds to this IP address? Now, when host B gets that, it gets all the information in this message, right? It has the IP address it's supposed to respond to, right? It says tell 192.168.1.100. It has the, the MAC address of that host. So it has the host MAC address. The source MAC address has that. 
And so it has all the information to respond just targeted back to host A so that host C never has to see it. Yep. Say that again. Once it gets a reply, and that's how when once we've done ARP, it gets the reply back, it updates its ARP cache, and now it can start a communication directly to host B. And so, yeah, that's the ARP request that goes out. So the ARP request goes out, and this is where this really important this uh, middle line here, because host C will also get this ARP request. And then the host B will send an ARP reply back, which says, hey, from 0131B98B8, B8, host B's MAC address, to MAC address 8046748A3, uh, ARP reply 192.168.1.10 is at 0131D98B8. So it's able to reply back. And then as soon as host A gets that, now it says, aha, now that I know this mapping and I know that the IP address I'm trying to talk to and send an IP packet to is on my local network, I know how to send that data. So it then goes forward and we sent, we can see IP packets. So we have a a packet, so the ethernet header, so we have a host A's ethernet, host B's ethernet, an IP packet from 192.168.1.100 to 192.168.1.10, an ICMP echo request, and then that gets to host B, assuming it's still up and it's configured to reply to us, it'll reply. And so it says, hey, from host B's MAC to host A's MAC, IP address 192.168.1.10, um, is the source IP address and the destination is 192.168.1.100 ICMP echo reply and what will happen on both hosts so we can actually use the ARP command to look up their ARP cache and we'll see that both hosts uh, have updated their internal cache to map that IP to that MAC address so host A says aha 192.168.1.10 is at this uh, MAC address and host B will say host A's IP address is at host A's MAC address. Cool. Questions on this? And everybody see how we kind of get this uh, so that all the packets are the yellow uh, thing here, which is the larger uh, kind of square, is the Ethernet headers, the Ethernet uh, frame. I think it's technically called a frame, but whatever, uh, which encapsulates inside of it the IP packet. So that's kind of exactly how this, this data goes between there. Uh, what's the 60 and the 80 on, you're talking about on this slide? Oh, uh, next to the ARP and the IP. Uh, I don't know. I think it's some. Um, it's one of the flags. So uh, the other, when you get into this, you'll use tools like. Um, so we'll show you in this how to capture the traffic, how to analyze it. There's graphical tools that will uh, parse it into all its constituent parts. This is just kind of a showing a high level of what you might be interested in from this packet. But you can ask TCP dump for more information. You can say, show me the exact like raw bytes of that packet and then you can decode it manually or something if you want to oh, excuse me. cool so you now know how data moves in a local network from one system to another this is exactly what's happening right now with my machine to that uh to the wireless router that's somewhere right the data is currently flowing packets are flowing from me to the router so as we'll see uh, multi when you want to do non so when you need to send an IP packet to somebody not in your local network you first send it to essentially a router or a gateway that knows how to get it out of there but that step is exactly what we just talked about you have to do ARP to figure out the MAC address and then you send it not to the destination because it's not to the destination but you send it to the next hop and their job is to get it somewhere else and their job is to get it somewhere else and it goes all the way and believe it or not hopefully you believe it uh, you actually know enough to conduct some local area network attacks. And why is that? So what may we want to do? So pretend now 
you're in some network somewhere, you either compromise host C or you just maliciously you broke or you broke their Wi Fi password. So now you're onto their network or you've plugged into an Ethernet port in a company. You're now on the local network. What what might you want to do? What would your goals be as an attacker? What well, high, higher level? What would I what would I want to accomplish as an attacker? That may be a mechanism of how to do it. Yeah, I may want to talk to people on the network, right? See what's on there. Maybe there's an unencrypted file share or something, or something that doesn't require authentication. But what else? I may want to impersonate being another user or another machine. Maybe there's a trust relationship established between host A and host B, where host A is the, um, well, I don't know, is uh, the source code repository and host B is some developer machine and the developer's machine can just access it without authentication, but anyone else from marketing or whatever would have to authenticate. Yeah, um, somebody mentioned in the chat, uh, sniffing conversations. I may want to eavesdrop on the communication between host A and host B. Why might that be useful? Get sensitive information. Maybe uh, there, and it may surprise you, but there are many protocols still in use today that transmit passwords over the network in the clear without encryption. And if you get a hold of that communication, you can just get those passwords. Uh, this actually happened when we were doing a uh, pen test of a company. We got a tap of their network communications and we just kind of listened to it and later analyzed it. And we found out like, oh, there's this FTP site that they're using to upload content. And it has a, the, they're using the FTP that they're using. They didn't use the secure like SFTP or anything. So the password is just right there. And so we were able to log on and like use that to do stuff. Um, there's uh this is well anyways so we'll get into all the nasty stuff but yeah so i think so our goals we may want to impersonate a host on the network right we may want to pretend to be somebody else you're getting um a good lesson in you know trying to pretend to be somebody else or another identity um denial of service we may want it so that uh host a is just off the network and can't talk to anybody uh, we may want access to information like we talked about, so this could be through snooping or other types of means, and we may want to tamper with uh, some of the delivery mechanisms. And so kind of what there, it kind of comes down to three basic attacks, so this is whenever you're thinking about networks or other types of communication mechanisms. Um, you want to be thinking of these three main avenues of attack, how do I so sniffing here is the same as kind of wiretapping or listening, how do I detect. How do I see what's going on on this network? Spoofing is pretending to be a different host. So how do I pretend to be a different host on this network? As host C, can I pretend to be host A? And finally, hijacking. So how can I, if host A and host B are having a communication, how can I hijack their communication and either uh, pretend like one of them said something that they didn't or maybe delete messages or something like that so these are kind of the three main attacks that we, we want to be thinking about and so one of the main things thinking about what we were talking about here if i'm oc and i'm malicious and i want to sniff all traffic on the network so in this diagram i just have like a wire black line right that's connected to other black lines so if i just listen and i'll we'll show you how to do this so you can set up your network card to say hey give me everything you get don't just drop because by default the network card won't even bother your os and cpu if it gets a um if it gets an ethernet um, message that's not meant for you it just drops it um, it's smart enough to do that but you can tell it no send me everything send me every single packet you get i want to see it and so if you do that, can host C, like if host A and host B are having a conversation, could you listen in on what they're talking about? Yeah. 
Yeah, it depends a lot. It, it all depends on the, on the network architecture. This is where the details of what's going on actually are really important because they're important to you as an attacker of what you can do. And it actually comes down to the difference between hubs and switches. Um, so, uh, anybody, I'm trying to wonder if there's any here. I think there's a big one back there. Anybody know, everybody know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about like a switch? Like a thing that you plug Ethernet, uh, a bunch of Ethernet cords into, right? The back of your Wi Fi router will probably have, it's at least got one port to connect the cable box or whatever to it for the uh, cable modem. Um, let me explore for a minute. So there's a lot of tape back here. I'm sure this is. Okay, this is all audio, but I have no idea how it works. But... There must be. Oh. Let's see the table. It says it's video. All right, I'm gonna stop this. But uh, I was hoping I to just show the uh, like a networking box. But anyways, um, so early network switch switches were simple hubs. So they were a device that looks exactly like a normal switch that you plug Ethernet cords into. And what they would do is basically they were not very smart. They they just um, worked on a principle of whenever any data came in on one of the ports, it went out on the other ports. So will that get the data to where it needs to go in this diagram? Yeah, it's great. Packet comes from host A, boom, send it out everywhere. Packet comes in from host B, boom, send it out everywhere. Sounds pretty easy. I think you could do that, right? What's uh, some of the downsides of that approach? Yeah, it's very easy to listen to traffic. All you have to do is host C is just start listening and you'll get every packet that's on the network. What about non-security things? I'm listening to C and host A and B are having a conversation and I have to check that all of that is not coming. Yeah, it's a lot of overhead. You're getting every, if there's a large conversation between A and B, you're getting every single packet, which may or may, which may or may not be efficient. And if you as host C wanted to talk to another host D who wasn't involved in that communication, host A and host B are using all that bandwidth. So your communication between C and D is severely limited and there may be like uh, problems there. Um, so it's a bad, uh, it's not a very good way of um, using resources. And so uh, modern switches are much more, um, and there's, you'll find marketing terms of like L2, L3, whatever, blah, blah, blah switches. I, that stuff's not really important. What's important is understanding what they do and how it relates to what you're interested in. Um, so in this simple example, does host C need to know about this uh, IP? Echo reply packet? Why not? Uh, to understand that, you have to, well, I don't know how to say this, but kind of yes. But what about this specific packet? Like if you just looked at this packet and you were omnipotent, would you know exactly where it went? This one right here, the last one. You'd have to know when you say everyone, what, what specifically do you mean? Yeah, but what machine, right? There's only, there's very few things we have to actually tie identity. We actually don't know there's a technical machine there. Like host C actually could be connected to another hub, which is connected to other hubs, right? We don't actually know that there's a machine on the other end. But what can we tie things to?
So I have three ports on this switch. So we'll go each line, right? So host A is connected to port one, host C is connected to port two, host B is connected to port three. So let's walk through it step by step. So this, you are the switch. You're my, my switches now. So you get a packet on port one that says the source port is eight, I'm sorry, the source Mac is 804674A3 and the destination Mac is all ones, the broadcast Mac. So as the switch, where do you have to send this packet out? Everywhere. everywhere. Why everywhere? It's the broadcast. Do you need any other information besides what's contained in that packet to make that decision? No, because the person, the whatever, that machine on the other end, somebody's asking you to send this to everyone. So you just send it to everyone. Boom. It goes out to everyone. All right, that one's easy. Now the reply. So the reply from host B. So host B says, okay, I am 0131B98B8. Send it to MAC address. I'm trying to send a, an Ethernet message to MAC address 8046748A3. Now you're the switch. What port does that should that go out on? Just port one. Why? Ah, so that's how we can do it. The why is because host A on port one, there's some host that has the MAC address 8004607048A3. And if we're smart about what we're tracking in those two packets, as soon as we see this packet one, this very first ARP request, like let's assume we know nothing, right? All those systems are off. We turn them all on. There's no network communication. The very first packet is a packet on port one of this of this ARP request. Now we we just said we know where to send that that uh, ARP request. We send it everywhere, but this also tells us something about the things that are connected to our ports, right? It tells us oh on port one there's something with the MAC address eight zero forty six forty seven. Oh sorry. 8046704A3. Which means that if I remember that and I get something that's destined for that, I can just send it right out to that port. So that's what the switch does, is it keeps track for each port. What are the source MAC addresses I've seen there? And that way when it gets something, it just sends it out just to that port. Make sense? Is that more complicated than just sending everything out everywhere? Yeah, it gets way more complicated, right? So the hardware has to handle that, the software that runs on the switch has to handle that, all these things have to deal with this. But you get a lot of nice performance benefits. Now a, a connection between just two things will only use the bandwidth of those two ports and not everyone's bandwidth. So that's way better. Um, can you just keep track of one MAC address to one port? Put it a different way. Can you have multiple MAC addresses that are on one port? Hmm? Yeah, so there may be, we could have a, um, like we said, we could have a switch plugged into port three, and that switch has four ports itself, and one of those is host B, but then there's also host D and E and F, right? So there may be four source MAC addresses that come out of this port, which we'd want to keep track of. Um, so yeah, we, we have, um, uh, we, we need to be able to keep track of it, but there's physical limits. So this is actually one thing that will come up. There actually are physical limits on how, well, I actually don't know what modern limits are, but you could imagine if you were writing this software, you'd have some limit of how many MAC addresses you could see on a certain port. Before at one point, you just have to be like, okay, I'm not keeping track. So for us, what does this mean for us listening? So we'll go back here. We'll say we are host C. We want to list, we want to sniff for traffic in the network. If we're on a hub, what does that mean? Yeah, set the adapter to listen, set the, uh, the network card to listen to everything, and then we're good. We're going to get every single reply, the, every single packet on this network. If we're a switch, if we're connected to a switch, what will we get? Um, 
Say it again. Yeah, we'll get the broadcast traffic. It's not that we won't get anything about the network, right? We'll get every ARP uh, request because that goes inherently to everyone. We'll get any other broadcast traffic that, that will go to everyone in the network. And so, you know, this could tell us about IP addresses on the network, just sniffing that will tell us, oh, there's this IP address, there's this IP address. We can actually see a little bit of who's talking to who in the network because we can see from the ARP request. Will we see any of the ARP replies? No, why not? Yeah, they're directed and not broadcast. Great, perfect. So we'll be able to see all that. We'll be able to see any, uh, there's some things that are like IP broadcast and stuff. We may see some of that, but we're not going to see the data communication between host A and host B. And that's why this stuff is important. Yeah, so uh, the, the name for this mode that I talked about is promiscuous mode. That's the, uh, you, you as an attacker don't usually need to do this. The tools that you're using will do it, but it's just a way to tell the, sick, the um, ethernet card or whatever it is. Um, the, Tricks do come in whether your network card actually allows this or not. So some network cards, uh, sorry, when I say network card, I mean, I think most, if not all ethernet ports and adapters will do this. I don't know of one that doesn't, I'm sure something will, but um, Wi-Fi is one, like wireless networking is one of the areas where not all of them will allow you to do this. So many people who uh, do this will, get like an external Wi-Fi adapter that they know is able to do this. And then they'll plug that into their machine. Also, you're way better if, uh, especially when doing wireless stuff, if you have an external antenna that can be large, it doesn't have to fit into like the contours of a laptop. So it should be much better. And so we have this problem, right? If we're on ethernet, if we're on like physical ethernet, and we need to kind of convince the switch. Like, how do we get all that data? We want all of that data. And so we'll look at that. First, we'll go into tools. So uh, this is actually really important and um, fun to use. I will tell you, even if you're sitting there or thinking about this on Zoom or watching the recording and thinking, well, I'm never going to uh, attack a network, so I'm just not going to pay attention or learn any of this stuff. Uh, I will tell you, being able to understand what's going on in a network and how networking works will help you at whatever job that you have. Um, I had this insane, well, I've had a couple insane issues. One time I set up a uh, web security project uh, for one of my classes a while back, and it was running off of our servers in our lab at ASU. And I was doing this thing where I was trying to test some things and my connection was getting dropped and I had no idea why or where it was happening. And so what I had to do is I got on as many machines as I could that were close to those hops. I ran these tools to look at the network traffic of what exactly was happening. And I was able to determine like, oh, there's some firewall somewhere that's blocking my traffic because it looks like a, um, it, it's looking for like web application uh, exploitation techniques. Um, so that was really useful. Another thing where this came up is when um, we had this crazy like networking outage in our lab where the networking would go like down for 30 seconds and then up for 30 seconds and like down for 30 seconds. And um, the way I proved that that was happening was I had one script running that was doing like a ping every second and logging to a file, whether it got it or not. And then I set up TCP dump on all of the things outside of our network to show like, look, the, the packets are going and leaving our network, but sometimes they're never returning. And so I was able to show this to the networking people and they're like, oh yes, this is bad. We will fix this. And so they, I don't know what the eventual problem was, but it's an incredibly frustrating experience when like things kind of, when things only go down for limited amounts of time, uh, it, it can be crazy. So the, these types of, um, Essentially, you can think of these as like network debugging tools it can help you in your career in crazy cases where you're you know, maybe de debugging something in production and it doesn't quite make sense of what's going on. Being able to look at the raw network and understand it is a very valuable tool. Cool. So there are command line tools that you can use for this. Uh, like I mentioned, TCP dump. This is kind of the bread and butter collects the traffic. 
Uh, you can have TCP dump just output like we saw those little like summaries of the packets. Um, you can also have TCP dump dump to a file, which is very useful. So that's what I typically do is like dump the, the traffic to a file and then copy it down to my local machine so I can analyze it with like a graphical UI. TCP flow is really cool. We'll get in, we'll see TCP, but, um, and TCP dump don't uh, be, I just realized I use it so much I don't even think about it, but uh, it collects everything. So it's not just TCP, UDP, literally almost everything. So, or anything on a network it will collect. Uh, TCP flow can, uh, will break apart a packet into different flows, which we'll see in TCP later. TCP replay is pretty cool. It allows you to replay recorded traffic. So you can record traffic and be like, oh, replay this at this other host, which can help you with debugging some issues. Uh, graphical, yeah, Wireshark is uh, the most well-known one. It works really well, it's open source and it's available on all platforms. Uh, this is what I use for network analysis. Um, it, uh, it has a number of parsers, so it, it will try to figure out what kind of packet it is and show you graphically, which we'll look at uh, in a second here. And um, one of the things that's very funny is uh, that, I don't, I haven't heard of this happening recently, but when I was doing my PhD and we were playing the uh, DEF CON CTF finals. So because you can see all the traffic on your network, one of the good strategies is to record the traffic, analyze it, try to look for vulnerabilities that are exploits that people are sending you and then ricochet them back to the other teams. You just weaponize them. Uh, so we actually had automated systems for this, but one of the uh, cool things that people did is they, uh, and also you'll open it up in Wireshark to look at it and try to understand the, the exploit. And so people would find a previously unknown vulnerability in Wireshark. Uh, they wouldn't weaponize it to the point where it would take over your machine, but it would crash Wireshark. And they would just include that in their attacks. So if you ever tried to like look at that packet in Wireshark, it would just crash immediately. So um, there's a lot of interesting things of uh, how people weaponize these things. So let's take a look. Where are we at in time? Oh, we're doing great. All right. I really don't even know if I have um, Wireshark installed here. Okay. Okay. Cool. So I can use uh, if config. There's a lot of different commands. Every operating system is different. This is part of oh, which you can't see anything of what I'm doing. Uh, maybe that's for the best. Um, okay. I'm going to download Wireshark in the background while I talk. Hopefully. Uh, bum, bum, bum. There we go. Cool. Okay. Uh, but yes, every operating system is different in terms of how you look at what uh, network interfaces are on your system. It will also be very complicated because many things will add. So if you're running things like Docker or virtual machines, they'll add network, like virtual network interfaces that are not actually part of the machine, uh, but allow really cool things to happen. So um, there we go. Is my Wireshark. All right, almost up. There we go. Look at that. Boom, software. Okay, and then let me change my displays so you can actually see what I see. Option drag, boom. Okay. Cool. So if config is, there's also uh, IP adder, I think is the latest like Linux way to figure out all this information, but um, I'm not running that right now. So the way to kind of read this is you'll have the device name. So this is like a name specific to your thing. There'll be, I don't know, some flags. Uh, MTU is that uh, maximum transmission unit that we talked about. So that's the physical device with the max size of data it can transmit. Uh, you'll see like in this example, there's the ether, the, um, the IP address, so 192.0.0.1, uh, this is the local LO0 or is your local network. Um, and uh, yeah, NetMask, uh, that's what I mentioned previously. 
So we can see, I think we already looked at this, but we can see that uh, EN0 is my wireless because I'm only connected to wireless. I'm connected to this uh, network. So let's, uh, so the way to use TCP man, TCP dump. Yeah, cool. Um, so obviously, like I always say, read the man page so you can understand what these tools are and what they do. There's a lot of crazy options um, in things like TCP dump. You can do things like uh, capture, capture traffic to a file. And then once that file reaches 10 megabytes, uh, create a new file. So you, you have your data into certain size chunks. You could even do, uh, when we were doing DEF CON CCF, because uh, we wanted to get all the traffic, but we also needed to do some analysis. You can also do things like after you're, you're going to rotate a file, uh, you can rotate it based on time or size, and then you can tell it, oh, when you rotate, call this script, the shell script, and then that shell script can do something with that new file, which we did was process it. So uh, yeah, all kinds of cool stuff uh, in here. Uh, some import, important things. Um, the slash n. So one of the things that um, that TCP dump will do is try to make the output nicer to you, and it will try to do things like, oh, if I see this IP address and I know it maps to this specific host, I'll tell you the host name and not the IP address. Uh, usually, you want to not look at any of that. Um, so, anyways, we can do TCP dump uh, slash n. So n for not uh, showing me all that stuff. I for what the interface is, so where you want me to find these packets that we're going to be looking at. And I guess I can make this bigger. Uh, da, da, da. And then, um, yeah, and then you can put filters. So that's the other thing that's really cool is you can do this expression. Yeah. So with this expression, you can say, uh, give me all packets that arrive to or departing from this host sundown. I can ask for IP packets specifically. There's a whole language in here and you can combine Boolean operations and you can even parse certain parts of the packet um, to get the data that you want. This helps. One of the key things, if you're um, SSHing into a remote system and you just run TCP dump, uh, without specifying anything, it will also show you all the packets that are coming from you and your remote ship machine, which causes more things to do, which causes more packets to do, and it just like goes forever and you will get lost there. But we can just do where we, yeah, TCP dump. I run it and at first it'll say, hey, uh, because getting raw access to the to the uh, device is not something that is normal. So you need to be root to be able to do this and to set promiscuous mode and all this stuff. So I can do that. Um, and I'll see a bunch of packets, right? What are these packets that are getting sent? A Zoom, it's definitely Zoom, right? All this stuff is, this is UDT packets. Remember we talked about a little bit um, UDP doesn't have any guarantees, so a lot of audio and visual streaming uh, will um, will be in there. No, I do not think your IPs are in here. I think we're I'm connected to Zoom and you're connected to Zoom, but uh, that would be funny. So I could do things like say, just give me the TCP packets. So now I don't have any um, of those IP packets. I bet there's still some Zoom stuff in here as well with the chats you would want over uh, TCP. Uh, there's probably also Dropbox. I'm running Dropbox, so it's connected to its thing. Like there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I could also ask for ARP packets. I'm actually getting a ton of ARP packets here. Um, and so we can see that this nice queue gives us a summary of what's going on. But if I really wanted to dig into these packets because I thought something was going on, I guess dash w temp. Well, let's just do it here. Uh, temp. Uh, okay, so it's listening now. Instead of printing us that output, it's printing uh, to this file. So it's writing out to temp output. I control C to kill it, and it says, "Great, I captured this." Uh, it says package dropped. Why might packets be dropped? 
Uh, not quite a firewall because these are coming to me, right? If they were dropped, I would never know about them in the first place. Say again? Can't hear you. Transmission issues? Yeah, uh, not quite transmission issues. It, it's basically like if you're, remember you, what you're trying to do is something not normal. You're trying to like listen to all packets so that, that your operating system will do its best job, but it's not gonna compromise the system just to get you every single packet on the thing, right? There could be uh, like tens of gigabits per second, like numbers of packets. So sometimes the kernel's like, whoop, sorry, I had to drop something because I don't have enough. Like memory is not free. I just don't have enough memory for all this stuff. Uh, okay, so we have this file, this temp output, and I should be able to open up my handy dandy Wireshark. Uh, a very good rule of thumb is to never run Wireshark as sudo as root. So with Wireshark, you can listen directly on network interfaces, and it uses TCP dump under the hood. The problem, of course, is if somebody is running stuff to pop your thing, it's not very good. So uh, it's always better to record to a file with TCP dump. And then um, because even though, well, even though you're using sudo with TCP dump, it drops permissions. So it's fairly well tested, I guess. Uh, okay, file open. Cool. Gratuitous ARP, that's a little, must be a technical thing. But now I can dig in. So the way to read this is, so I'm seeing all of the ARP. So we asked for ARP packets, right? So it's parsing it up here so I can see, okay. And then below it parses it into the different formats. So the frame here, so this is an ethernet frame. Um, there's all kinds of additional information here. Then the actual packet, so this is the source is from 188090F82A11 to this broadcast address. It's an ARP packet, and then we can actually see, so the re other really cool thing is on the bottom is the raw bytes that are captured of this packet. And then as I'm going through the structure, it's highlighting which parts of the raw packet correspond to this structure. So when I look over like, oh, which part in here specifies that it's uh, IPv4? Like, boom, it's this. Uh, and hardware size and protocol size and uh, the op code for ARP and the target uh, MAC address, the sender IP address. Like, so we can see these are all um, encoded of what we represent, right? When we talk about it. IP address is just 32 bits. Well, this is that IP address represented here. Uh, let's look at something more interesting. Uh, okay, so now I have t uh, TCP packets. And you can search for them. I should never, uh, hopefully can't see what why should I not be able to search for this hello message in here and find it? Yeah, hopefully it's encrypted, right? Otherwise, Zoom is doing something really, really bad. Um, but I can do things like, uh, let's look at this. Um, TCP, yeah, this is good. So here I'm just using curl to uh, access some IP, some websites. Uh, open so I can I can so this is the other cool thing that Wireshark will do so uh, if you can see this it's uh, coloring the trap the packets right so we have some TCP then we have this get request uh, and we could look through here this HTTP so we're getting slash on example.com and we'll actually see the raw response so if this had any um, sensitive information, we would actually see it all in here because we captured all that traffic. So that's why uh, HTTP has absolutely no propriety, no protection. We can just read that as is. HTTPS uh, does not. And so it can, yeah. Anyways, Wireshark is awesome. That's uh, super fun to look through this stuff. Questions on this?
All right. So turns out, so our core problem as we talked about is when two machines talk in a switch network as host C, we never get any of their packets. So now, so we looked at previously how ARP works. Now, what if we apply this security mindset that we've been developing to this analysis? So let's think about it from the perspectives of each of them. So host B, host B gets a packet that says, hey, this is the source MAC address, the destination MAC address, who has 192.168.1.10, tell 192.168.1.100. What can host B trust in this packet? Can they trust the map, the source MAC address? The way to think about it is put yourself in a scenario. If I'm host C and I have total control. Can I make a packet that just says I'm, I'm my MAC address is 8046748483? Sure. Nothing's gonna stop it. Uh, the broadcast is probably the only thing that it can trust. I think there's one thing, right? The, it knows that this was sent, destined for everyone. And it fundamentally doesn't know that the machine that has the, the IP address 192.168.1.100 has the MAC address 8046.7483. And then so it responds. Now, put yourself into the context of host A. What did host A know before it gets the ARP reply? It does know some things. It's not nothing. Host A does know some things. It knows the IP address it was trying to contact, right? It knows, hey, I'm trying to, it knows its IP address. It knows the IP address that it's trying to contact, and it knows its MAC address, right? So its MAC address, its IP address, the target IP address. Those are the only three things it knows. Now, when it gets this ARP reply back, what can it trust from this packet? Say it again. Yes, it can trust the source, but sorry, the destination map. So it can trust this first part that says, oh, this is destined for me. It must be for me. Right, it, it's it, it can just check that right. It doesn't have to spoof anything like that. So it can check that. Great. Does it know that this packet actually came from a machine with this MAC address? No. This could be spoofed. As host C, we can just write this out on the network, and the switch will take it and send it over. What about can it trust this ARP reply one nine two one six eight one dot ten? Kinda, it's the IP address that it's looking for. So it can know, oh, this is, I just asked for 192.168.1.10, and this is a reply for 192.168.1.10. Uh, can it trust that it's actually at 0131D98B8? Yeah. Who's to say that this didn't come from C? Who's to say that C doesn't reply with its own MAC address and its own information? And so what we're getting at here is there's actually a fundamental problem on local networks of this, of authentication, right? We have no way to tie the identity of this machine. When we get an ARP reply, uh, reply back, we have no way of knowing that there actually exists a machine with this IP address and this MAC address on the network. All we know is that we got an ARP reply. And so this leads us to ARP spoofing. So what if, let's say A and B are trying to communicate with each other. What if we're able to trick them that, what if we're able to trick host A, that host B MAC address is host C MAC address, 
And we're able to trick host B that host A MAC address is, is, is host C's MAC address. What will that happen with all their communication? It all goes to C, right? It will all go to C because they'll think it's sending it to that MAC address. It'll go, remember the switch doesn't know anything about IP addresses or anything. All it uses is the MAC address. It says, oh, this is destined for host C's MAC address. Good, join. And when B sends a packet, the same thing, it will go to C. And C knows, can know the true values. So it can actually then forward the packet to host B correctly, maybe altering it or doing whatever it wants in between. So this attack is uh, ARP spoofing. So the goal is we want to sniff and maybe even then modify all traffic between two hosts in a switched environment. And the core problem is this stateless nature of the ARP protocol, right? I just send a request, please somebody tell me who has this IP address or who, what's the MAC address of this IP address? And then we just respond, right? We just say, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm over here, trust me. And so you can see that these protocols that work to basically like fundamentally run the internet were never designed for, you know, when you're designing this stuff, you would never think like, oh, but what if there's an untrusted computer in our network? They look at you like, what are you talking about? There's eight people in this room. We're the only people running machines. Like, like we're administrators. We run all the machines in the network. Of course they're trusted, right? They weren't necessarily thinking about those things. So one of the crazy things is Actually, most uh, most machines will not keep track that, oh, I sent out an ARP request. They just will accept any reply. So if you reply with an ARP reply, even though they never asked, they'll just update their, their cache. And you can think about it from the operating system perspective, it's actually a lot simpler, right? If you only need to keep track so if you only need to implement one functionality of, oh, I need to know what IP, what MAC address this is. So you just send an ARP request. And then you have something else that whatever it gets an ARP reply just updates the cache and you're good to go. You don't have to do any other functionality. You don't have to, so you have to do things like, okay, but when I send a request, how long do I wait for a timeout before I get a response and yada, 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 all this other stuff. Um, And so we can actually, as an attacker, we can do multiple things. So one way is we can just send spoof ARP messages to both victims and essentially poisoning their cache. So why, is it, why are we calling this like poisoning their cache? Yeah, because it's not necessarily invalid, but it's under my control, right? As an attacker. So I'm controlling the value that's inside your ARP cache. That is what I want it to be. So I want you to, um, yeah, because it's, it's invalid, but it's a valid cache entry. That's kind of the, the tricky thing, right? That's why invalid, valid, it's incorrect for the state of the network, but based on the protocols involved, it's totally fine. And it's attacker controlled. So that's kind of the poison thing, so. Uh, then they'll just send their IP packets to us. And we've basically inserted ourselves in the middle of their connection. Um, and then the attacker host can then act as the router because the attacker knows the true IP address and max of each of the things, and then make sure the packets go correctly where they need to go. So let's uh, walk through this real quick. Um, okay, so we have host A, 192.168.1.100, host B, 192.168.1.10, and host C, this is our bad guy, 192.168.1.137. So we're all in the same local network. And what I'm gonna draw here is their caches of each machine. So these are the ARP caches. So host A said, knows that, so let's say it's set up correctly. Maybe there was an ARP request followed by an ARP reply that we didn't get involved with. Um, so 192.168.1.10, host B, 192.168.1.100. And host C knows, right? Host C knows the true MAC addresses of everyone. So the very first thing we'll do as host C is we will send an ARP reply from C to host A. And that ARP reply will say, hey, 
192.168.1.10 is at my MAC address, the attacker's MAC address. And Jose goes, great. I'm just going to update my table. And it will also, we'll also send a uh, ARP re uh, reply to host B saying, okay, 192.168.1.100 is at this. It updates its table. And, and what we can do, you know, we may be worried about timeout. So we can just send this every minute, every second, if we really wanted to. Uh, that way they'll just keep updating their internal caches. The cache entry will never get stale and they won't ever have to do an ARP uh, broadcast to say, hey, what's this? Who has this IP address or this MAC address? So now when host A wants to send a packet to host B, right? It's the exact same process that we talked about. It looks up in its local uh, ARP cache and it says, oh, do I know the MAC address of 192.168.1.10? Yep, here it is. Great, packets that I'm gonna send will get sent to host C. And to make sure that they don't actually know what's going on, host C will then take that, change the destination MAC to be the host B's MAC address and just send it out. And with that way, then the reply will also go the same way, right? It will go right here and then it'll go back. Kind of crazy, right? Yeah. So for the cache, when it's updating the address, there's no possible privilege that you find that it's going to have. Correct. Yeah. There's uh, very little. The other way you could do this, so um, is if you could race the ARP reply, right? So you could, if uh, host A makes an ARP request, and you can either try to be, the question is if you want to be first or last, right? So if you, if you kind of lock in that entry, as long as you can beat host B, or you could also uh, maybe trigger denial of service. So to send a ton of traffic to host B from this system or another system, so that host B doesn't get that or is delayed in processing that. So host A then broadcasts, hey, who has this IP address? Your host C is not loaded, so it can respond quicker than host B. That would be another way to do it. There's all kinds of uh, tricks that you can play here with how to make sure you win, win the race in the way that you want to. But most operating systems don't do that. They just, as soon as you get this reply, you just update your cache. So you don't even need to do that. You just start to spam ARP replies to your two victims, and then they just update their cache entries and now everything flows to you. So yeah, like this is why uh, legitimate, and this actually, so one of the worst networking cases you can be in is when you're on a network and two hosts have the same IP address. This actually causes the same thing. You send an ARP request of who has this IP address and two machines respond. So you get non-determinism of which one you're actually talking to. Uh, this happened to us when I was doing my PhD in our lab uh, because we ran out of IP addresses and apparently like the DHCP server was giving out the same IP address to different machines and I would SSH into a machine and like sometimes it would be fine and then other times it would say uh, this is the wrong host like this, a super scary warning and I was like what is going on this doesn't make any sense and then I was actually like using network tools that you look at what's going on you're like wait why am I getting two ARP replies back that's insane so um so yeah, this is not an old attack. This still works. Um, so most tools uh, will repeatedly send spoofed ARP replies to keep the cache in the desired state. Uh, the other thing, so there, there's a tool you can actually use to do this. So editor cap is a tool, um, you know, like we've been talking about in the class, uh, do these things ethically, right? So it's definitely, you are advised to test these things, do this, in a local environment, especially now in this day and age, you have multiple machines, multiple devices, like set up an environment where you control all the machines and everything involved or get your roommates or whatever, like approval to, to do this. Uh, that's what I, when I was messing with this, uh, I'd have a bunch of machines, but I lived in a house with other people. And so I'm like, hey, can I mess with your guys' computers for a little bit? And they're like, sure, do whatever you want. So uh, yeah, you learn how to run editor cap and you can, uh, 
get their traffic going through you and you run TCP dump on another thing and you're like, oh my God, I literally am getting all the traffic that they're sending. Um, And we've already seen an example of, so this is basically, we're also, you know, once we've done this, right, we were spoofing ARP replies, we can use this exact same principle to spoof IP packets. Because again, nobody on the network is checking that we actually have that IP address. Right? And we actually didn't talk about how we get the IP address, but that's actually a separate issue because it doesn't really matter. And so, um, IP spoofing is basically sending a data, uh, an IP datagram packet impersonating uh, another host as the source address. So it's exactly what it sounds like. So you can have multiple machines on the network and the attacker machine, in this case, 11, 10, 20, 121, can send a packet pretending to be 111, 10, 20, 76, which is the phone device, to 111, 10, 20, 14, send that IP packet there. Now the problem is, where is this packet going to go back when when uh, dot fourteen replies? Where is it going to reply to? Say it again. The dot seventy six. Yeah. So we need to use to get that reply. We need to use uh, ARP poisoning or something to make sure that we got that reply. But this is kind of a fundamental principle as we look at um, sending and doing spoofing across multiple networks. Is how do we ensure? that we get that reply? Or how do we deal with the fact that we won't get that reply if we never get it in the first place? So uh, yeah, if you can think of it, this was like a packet that like an NFS, like network file system uses UDP. If this was a packet that said delete rm-rf slash, right? All your data is gone. And that's because they're, and usually so spoofing again, takes advantage of a trust relationship. So you have to have something that says, hey, 111 10 20, uh, 76 is trusted by 111 10 20, 14. If we can just do whatever we want on the system anyways, then we don't really need any of this fancy stuff, right? But this is one of the key reasons why you can't, especially in a local network, you can't trust the IP addresses because nobody is checking that anybody is exactly who they say they are. All right, questions? You just learned enough to be dangerous on a local network. And hopefully understood why, right? Like why these things actually arise and why you can do this. Cool. All right. Uh, of course, when you come back from spring break and you've completely forgotten everything about networking, we'll continue on uh, indirect delivery. So uh, have a good spring break and I will see you. Uh, week and a half or whatever Tuesday after spring break.